Hello everybody, let's talk about lipids and how they relate to nutrition. These words get thrown around a lot, so let's figure out what they mean from a biochemical structure point of view. Saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. So with saturated fatty acids, basically you have that long hydrocarbon chain and there's as many hydrogens that can possibly be packed in. There's no double double bonds. There's no double bonds between the carbons. And like every fatty acid over there on the left, it has a carboxylic uh, acid. Um, that's why they call it fatty acids, because that COOH over there, it'll drop off that H, and that H will become a hydrogen ion and lower the pH. So that's why all these fatty acids, they'll have that carboxylic acid group attached to them. And that's the... that's that carbon there is the alpha carbon. And then if you go to the very end, that's the omega carbon. And then with unsaturated fatty acids, you have a double bond between one or more uh, carbons. So you could put more hydrogens into that molecule there, uh, but because you have a double, double bond, there's not, you know, you don't have those hydrogens. There's four bonds between those carbons. And um, whenever you have a saturated fatty acid, you can see that's a straight line. They line up really tight and are solid at room temperature. Whereas you have unsaturated fatty acids like a plant source. A lot of times it's liquid at room temperature because all those kinks don't allow it to, to lay flat, you know, stacks of them to lay flat on each other. Cis and trans fatty acids. Normally, Fatty acids that are unsaturated are in the cis form and our body knows what to do with them. But when you eat these trans fats, this is about as bad as it gets for your um, heart heart disease. And, and uh, because whenever you get these trans fats, it up, brings up your LDL or what people call your bad cholesterol. And it brings down your HDL, which is what people call your good cholesterol, which is also lipid. Cholesterol is a lipid. So uh, low density lipoproteins are considered bad, high density lipoproteins are considered good, and trans fats will throw these the wrong direction. And here's some foods that are trans fats. You have, you know, fries, anything fried. Uh, trans fats happens whenever you try to hydrogenate something, which is basically just stuffing hydrogens in. Uh, let's see if I have a, um, so whenever, they tried to take a plant source margarine and make it solid. It's liquid at room temperature. So when they try to jam in these hydrogens, sometimes they get these trans fats. Same thing with peanut butter. You know, you have natural peanut butter and then you have the peanut butter that, that um, doesn't have the fluid on top. So to make it a solid, you know, peanuts are a plant source to make it a solid at room temperature. They, they, cram these hydrogens in, it's called hydrogenation, and you get these trans fats. So eating natural peanut butter is better. Eating uh, butter is probably better than eating margarine because you don't have as many trans fats. Neither is really good for you. And um, just something to really key in on because these play a big role in heart disease. There's two types of uh, fatty acids that we talk about a lot. Omega-3s, which are good, they're anti-inflammatory, and omega-6s, which are pro-inflammatory, which means they cause inflammation. And these can get embedded in our, another type of lipid that's in living organisms is phospholipids. And phospholipids will have these fatty acid tails in, in the actual cell membrane, and they'll incorporate these omega-3s and omega-6s from our diet and if you know our balance gets off, uh, we can have more inflammation in our body, which inflammation is the source of so many diseases, including uh, atherosclerosis and heart disease going that direction. So omega-3s are really good to incorporate in the diet. It's one of the few things I supplement with because it's there's only a few foods that have omega-3s. We really want that balance to be about three to one omega-6 to omega-3s. 
in the United States, it's about 16.7 to one. So we could do a lot better. Omega just comes from, as far as the structure goes, uh, that last, let me, let's see. So that last carbon is the omega carbon. You count one, two, three over from the last carbon. And that is an omega three because that's a double bond right there. That's its first double bond coming from the omega side. If you go over to the omega six, you have to count six uh, bonds between the carbons before you have your first double bond. So both of these are unsaturated fatty acids. And so that's omega six. And just having that placement, that double bond right there versus where the omega three is, is gonna cause um, a lot of issues with inflammation. So that's, um, that's that phospholipid membrane look, you know, it's a, it's a lipid bilayer and, um, these, the, these are examples of omega threes, EPA and DHA that can embed into those cell membranes right there where those fatty acid tails are coming off that, that phosphate head of the phospholipids. So the blue represents omega three EPA and the green in the bottom picture represents the DHA. These are really good uh, omega threes. DHA is really important for the brain and brain development. So sources of omega threes. So we want to incorporate a lot of walnuts, flax seeds, uh, fatty fish, especially salmon. And um, you want to be careful eating fish that are big and predator fish that live a long time and tuna falls into that category. So be careful how much tuna you eat for the uh, mercury levels will build up. And then as you go down to omega six, you see that that's a lot of different um, vegetable oils and um, stuff like that. So omega six is a precursor to arachidonic acid, which is a precursor to prostaglandins. And that's what we take Advil for is to, to decrease the inflammation by stopping those prostaglandins. So omega six is our pro inflammatory. So mercury levels in fish, I alluded to tuna being um, up there on the high level. You can see that uh, canned albacore tuna, that's the white tuna and ahi that they use a lot with uh, and yellowfin with uh, sushi and, and the ahi tuna that, you know, they kind of sear and put on salads. So be careful there. If you're going to eat tuna, you know, it comes in cans. It could be chunk lot. Those are smaller fish. So don't accumulate quite as much uh, mercury. And you can see they fall more in the medium, but wild caught salmon is the way to go. Sardines and our anchovies are great because they're so small that they don't build up mercury in their tissues. If you can stomach the fishy taste, uh, there's some others on the low end that are better to, uh, get, but it's, salmon's nice cause it's, uh, it's giving you a lot of omega threes plus low mercury. They have small mouths. They go back and um, spawn and die where they uh, were born. And so they don't really live a long time. So they don't really have a chance to build up all that mercury. So as far as good fats to bad fats, you know, the ketogenic diet, there's this push for, you know, eating all these good fats and monounsaturated fats. Those are the way to go. Uh, olive oil, Stephen Gundry, he says the only reason you should eat is to try to get olive oil in your mouth. Uh, nuts, avocados, so plant sources are usually good. Um, and then as you go move up, you know, trans fats, as bad as it gets, saturated is not much better. So um, it's best to, monounsaturated just means it has one double bond in the whole fatty acid chain. You can see it there in the middle on the right. And the Mediterranean diet, they have a ton of monounsaturated fats in their diet. And it's the most heart healthy diet of all the diets that they've looked at. And, you know, they eat pasta and bread and all that, but they also go through about an average of a liter a week of olive oil. So the health benefits of a ketogenic diet. So ketones, uh, or what your liver makes basically in response to staying really, really low on carbohydrates. If you go low enough on carbohydrates, which looks like 85% fat, 10% protein, 5% carbohydrates, 
it takes a lot to do it, but once you get those ketones, it's supposed to protect your brain function um, and decrease inflammation in your body, protect against some cancers. So some people have used the ketogenic diet uh, as, as a way to have a, uh, to, for, to improve their health. So uh, there's three different ketones the livers make, the liver makes. Acetone is just kind of, it's uh, fingernail polish and it's breathed off, but acetoacetate can convert to beta hydroxybutyrate, that middle one. And uh, beta hydroxybutyrate is what our body can use as an energy source. All right, so I mentioned earlier LDL and HDL, LDL being the worst of the two, but it's, you know, it's been villainized, but it also carries our cholesterol to our brain. It carries it to our endocrine glands that make our steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen and progesterone and cortisol and aldosterone. So it's important to, to get that delivery. What we don't want is the small, dense LDL uh, particles there on the right. Uh, and what causes this is glycation. So it's important to avoid having high blood sugar, hyperglycemia, and that, you know, eating refined carbohydrates, not eating whole foods, you can end up with glycation. If you have diabetes, make sure it's controlled because that elevated sugar will, when sugar binds to LDL, it glycates it and forms this, the small LDL particle. High triglycerides, that just goes right along with uh, refined carbohydrates. Even though triglycerides are a lipid, what causes your triglycerides to go up in your blood is eating refined carbohydrates. And then of course, trans fats. So if you can basically just keep those refined carbohydrates down, eat low glycemic index foods, which means that they enter the bloodstream nice and easy and smooth, then you can eliminate these LDL particles from making it down to the small LDL particle. And these are bad because what they do is they, they're so small, they can penetrate that arterial wall. So our arteries are lined with endothelial cells. And when the small dense LDL particle, it can squeeze in between those little cells that line our artery and start to uh, create plaques or atherosclerosis. It, it, it accelerates that process. Up there at the, the top one, it doesn't bind well to LDL receptors, which means it increases its residence time. That means that the, the small dense LDLs circulate in our bloodstream longer and cause more, gives them more time to, to cause issues with the artery wall. You know, we want LDL to bind to the LDL receptor, dump off its cholesterol that's needed for the cell membranes and whatnot, and then go back to the liver. So when that residence time is increased because these small dense LDL particles don't bind to the LDL receptors very well, um, it, like I said, it causes more issues. Another one is it increases susceptibility to oxidation. When LDL cholesterol gets oxidized, it forms atherosclerosis. So, you know, you have several different reasons here. We want to prevent the small dense LDLs from, from occurring. And that is it. Thank you.